I'm a big fan of the Ghostbusters franchise. Ghostheads, we call ourselves sometimes, and I've been eating up every little bit I can since I was just a tiny little kid in the 80s watching the real Ghostbusters while drinking Acto Cooler. Well, in 1990, we got a video game tie-in from Activision for the NES based on Ghostbusters 2. And people have just never really liked it. I'm here right now to probably not change your mind, but I definitely want to give a different perspective. If you're hoping for this to be a defense for the movie Ghostbusters 2, well that might be a video for a different time. This is primarily a video game channel. But I will say Ghostbusters 2 in general is horribly underrated. All you haters are just flat out wrong. It has some issues and has sequel-itis, sure, but I have a lot of love for that movie. To quote Ray Stance, But what a ride. Now historically, Ghostbusters games just aren't well received in general anyway, except some of the ones that still seem to be off the radar after all these years in the 2009 PS3, 360, Wii, PS2 game, Ghostbusters, the video game. It was somewhat recently remastered for PS4 and Xbox One, and is still amazing today, by the way. Ghostbusters 2 for the NES was developed by Imagineering and published by Activision. It hit the US market in April of 1990 and didn't hit Europe until almost a year later in March of 91, though I've seen other release dates used. If you're good with remembering dates, you might notice the initial US release missed the mark quite a bit since the movie was released in June of 1989. By the time this game hit Europe, the real Ghostbusters was already about to close out its run and Ghostbusters Mania was winding down. Imagineering is not a well-known name in terms of video game development, but you have very likely played a few of their games, such as A Boy and His Blob or Bart vs. The Space Mutants. Obviously, their video game output is a little inconsistent, but I don't know how long they had to develop this title if it started before or after the release of the movie, or if that had any impact on the game in any way. It wouldn't surprise me if it was a short development time, considering some of the design decisions and the length of the game entirely. Probably one that didn't start until after the movie released, or not long before it. But let's start breaking the game down bit by pun totally intended bit. Unlike the original Ghostbusters game, which was more of a business sim that also played out in context of the movie's basic plot, Imagineering took Ghostbusters 2 to a more of a typical action title with a run and gun style being the majority of the gameplay. That unfortunately doesn't feel very much like what the Ghostbusters is about, but to me it works a little better than the approach from that original business sim style. Sure, in the original Ghostbusters game and all of its ports, you literally approach it like a Ghostbuster as it is directly in the movie. You know, like an exterminator, where you drive to a place you got the call from, and you and your team member catch the ghost. But the way that mechanic works leaves something to be desired, and this whole part of moving around the map isn't exactly exciting. But that's a different discussion. I only bring this up for context and perspective, considering this is defending the choices made for Ghostbusters 2. But Imagineering's approach for Ghostbusters 2 at least is constantly engaging, despite feeling like the wrong basic concept. Imagineering made an interesting decision on top of this by taking away the iconic proton pack and equipping all the Ghostbusters with a slime blower to give it another connection to the movie. It's slime time. But the way it works is a bit messy, and I mean that literally, as it will land on the ground in front of you and will cause your character to slip up in place for a moment. Best strategy is to keep it in a high arc, which you do by pressing up or down on the D-pad, and it is really the only way to go about it in my opinion. I think a lot of people come in and want to have it face out front just like any other run and gun, but all the enemies, Slimer, various ghosts, and the GB logos will come in from a high angle anyway, so you really want to move the blower. I think new players expect to need to adjust the slime blower and then just make a mess of the level in game. It's not a great design, no, but it really isn't that broken. You also have the option to drop a trap at any time, which can be used to get rid of obstacles and certain enemies will require the use of the trap. Once it sucks up one or several things, it has to be kicked off the screen for another to be dropped. You'll have to go through four of these stages, the river of slime, the courthouse, the subway, and the museum. Each one of them uses a different buster to help set the scene a bit, going from Ray to Winston, Egon, and then Peter. Though the museum cheats a bit, since you need to get through it with all four busters anyway. I always enjoyed that Winston got the run of the courthouse level since he was conveniently absent during the scene in the movie. I like to think a programmer really wanted to correct that obviously grave error. These stages all run the same way. Oddly enough, right to left compared to just about any other video game at the time, and they force you to never stop moving while shooting ghosts and dodging obstacles. That's right, you can never stop. It's not an auto-scroller, but you just can't stop. If you do for too long, this tiny monster will catch up to you and will cause you to lose a life. The obstacles are the biggest challenge, and since any one hit is a loss of a life, there is no health bar. You need to watch your timing and your jumps. This is the biggest complaint for these levels. One hit causes the Ghostbuster for that level to collapse in a weird, horrifying ball and lose a life. 
so it's three hits and a game over screen. Yikes. Not really a super fun experience, especially for a kid. But these levels all play out exactly the same. This is 100% a game of reflexes and memorization. It's a basic proto take on something that's become super common in indie titles and mobile gaming. It's also become very common in place in discussions about games that people once despised, like right now. Once you take it into account and take the time with the game, the levels open up and feel more enjoyable. It is more a practice makes perfect situation, likely done to pad the game length. Ghostbusters 2 can definitely trip you up, but in my opinion, these levels are pretty breezy to get through once you have a bit of that muscle memory, and in my opinion, plenty of fun while doing that. Okay, now we've arrived at the part that you've probably been wondering how I can possibly defend it. Or if you're not familiar with the games, this is the part everyone seems to absolutely despise. It's time to drive the Ecto-1A. Don't be wrong, the driving stages aren't amazing by any standard, and they deserve being criticized. But they are far from being unplayable, and honestly, with all these years under my belt, I rather enjoy them now. These flip back to usual left to right and are auto-scrolling obstacle courses, with lots of random gates, barriers, lots of ghosts to blast, and of course giant pits that can swallow up entire buildings. These pits are 99.9% .9 of the time the biggest complaints for this game, and it's rather easy to fall into them. But it's just as simple in theory as hitting the arrow and hitting jump right at the hole. I don't honestly get the complaint. Over that complaint, I take how stiff the vertical and diagonal movement is, making it sometimes easier to just ram your car into a barrier, or how slow the regular gun is, or just how silly it is that the Ecto jumps at all. But I think it stems from the same issue I had as a kid playing Battletoads. I remember not being sure about jumping when hitting the ramps, and when it didn't work one way or the other, what I was doing wrong. But much like the Turbo Tunnel, once you have it, you have it. The shooting continues in these stages, but you don't need to worry about any angles or aiming. You have a shot that comes out of the front and one from the top. Nothing ever comes at you from the top. It's just there to hit a few power-ups and your main focus needs to be on the ghosts directly in front of you. Though the power-ups are handy, giving you a faster pink slime shot and then a crazy orange wave beam type thing. A quick pro tip, if you feel like you're going to be in a hairy situation, slam into a barrier. It does not take a life away and it gives you a moment of invincibility frames. Other than that, the driving stages are pretty straightforward. Don't push forward too much until you learn the pattern and you'll be fine. Of course, we had to control the Statue of Liberty from Liberty Island while you squeeze some New Year's juice from the Big Apple. Here's something off the request line from Liberty Island. That would be crazy if they didn't. It's epic, it's cool, it's exactly what you want in a game based on Ghostbusters 2. But boy, does this whole stage suck. I disagree with everyone's opinion about this game until right at this moment. At least the sprite art for the Ghostbusters and Lady Liberty is kind of cool. Okay, okay, I'm trying to defend the game, not trash it. But it is in my opinion the weakest part, but it's manageable. It mostly plays like a slower version of the regular action stages, with the only real difference is that it is completely auto-scrolling and you don't jump. You have the option of moving forward or backward to avoid the various ghosts, but you shoot using the torch, which moves up and down in the same way as the slime blowers. Again, it works best most of the time in this high arc. The problem with the Statue of Liberty stage is that it's built like a shoot 'em up, but you have none of the mobility. You just have to walk forward and backward a bit, hoping the onslaught of enemies gets caught up in your firing pattern and doesn't run into you. At least they recognize the problem and you no longer have just a one hit scenario before losing a life. You have a damage bar now. The second problem is that it's way too long. It is almost all padding since the game is so short. You have two back-to-back -back levels, one coming from Liberty Island and the other one downtown, and each one is long on their own. It would have been a much better situation to have a single level with a neat transition into the skyscrapers. There's also the issue that the second stage has these lightning clouds at the beginning that guarantee at least a few hits in the section with the completely invisible ghosts. But they do give you bombs for those sections, just don't forget about them. They are very important, and once you shoot one off, they will scroll across the screen to give you an opportunity to grab another. But we wrap up the game with that museum section going through with all four Ghostbusters with each run mirroring their specific level from earlier. Winston's run uses the same enemies from the courthouse, for example. Once all four arrive, they each slime Vigo while he is still in the painting, and the game wraps up. There's unfortunately no battle with Vigo, so it's kind of a bummer, but maybe it's for the best. 
I feel like how the game is structured, some random mechanic shoehorned in for a boss battle would have probably been worse. I will say this game has some really inconsistent design. You can definitely tell where they spent the most of their time, but most people say the sprite work isn't good, and I find that to be a bit reductive. Yes, the work they did for each Ghostbuster isn't great, which is a nice way to say it honestly looks like something you'd see on Atari 7800 or the first few years of the NES. They're just very blocky and basic. By contrast, the backgrounds are fairly nice in several instances, and there is a good use of the color palette. While the obstacles and enemies are a mixed bag, for example, some are just a shape and a color, but the bouncing view heads aren't exactly hard to recognize. But it's pretty obvious they spent a lot more time trying to bring Slimer to life. From the intro scene to the small ones in every level, the driving scenes, and the big one in the courtroom, it's really nice sprite work, and not only looks like Slimer, but looks perfectly ghostly. The cutscenes, Vigo in the painting, and similar are all really nicely done as well. It's a mixed bag, but far from the worst I've seen on the console in even around that time. The music is also not bad, honestly. You have some nice versions of songs from the movie and the Ghostbusters theme is replicated rather well. Which I'm not going to play here for fear of some copyright nonsense. But they are repetitive just like the level styles, so you're only going to hear the same theme from the action stages and the driving stages. It is certainly inoffensive, and I do really enjoy the rendition of Higher and Higher. So I feel like I do need to bring up new Ghostbusters 2 from HAL Labs, easily the number one reason that people have maintained that Imagineering's take is so bad. There is simply a much better version out there. It really is fantastic. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it deserves its own thing, but a quick comparison is called for. The HAL version took a much better approach to the concept of Ghostbusters by having you select a team of two with one being mostly controlled by the CPU. One zaps and the other traps and you use the strategy of holding the ghost with one character while the CPU comes around so you can throw out a trap. This is a fantastic way to play a Ghostbusters game, not just when limited to the 8-bit generation, but in general. You even get to play as Louis Tully. HAL's choice of liberties to take on the story beats, levels, and design were all fantastic. It really doesn't matter if the music tracks are or are not ripped from the movie, and the chibi art style for the top-down pixel art are still very unique for each character. The game feels balanced for the majority of it, and the arcade, gauntlet-style action is very engaging. Of course, I don't find it perfect either, but that again is for another time. But the really great video game here doesn't negate the fun of the other version in my mind. They're just different versions, and yes, one happens to be a bit better. The more the merrier though, in my mind. Different ports or versions of the same game based on the same character often are more interesting than just a bad versus good situation. Look, I'm not saying Ghostbusters 2 on the NES is a fantastic game by any means. It's a bit of shovelware, to be honest. It's a licensed title with only a handful of levels and you can beat it in less than an hour. Some of my love is nostalgia, I'll admit that. I have had my same copy since 1990 and spent many weekends watching my rental copy of Ghostbusters 2 on VHS and playing the NES game. But even with some complaints and even with some definite design missteps, I still think it's a rather solid experience. It's a 5 or 6 out of 10 or something stupid like that, especially when comparing to other licensed games of the era and even from the same studio. Really, what I want to drive home with this video is to not let the negative game rage that is so constantly fed on the internet convince you something isn't worth your time. You may not have a life-changing experience every time, and not every game can win awards, but sometimes those smaller experiences can be exactly what you needed. You may find you've been missing out on something. It may not be the game you want to play all the time, but right then and there, it was satisfying, and you had a new experience. All right, that's all for me, Kevin, and this episode of Retroactive. Let me know why you hate Ghostbusters 2 and why I'm wrong. Or if you do check it out and enjoy it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. I also have a coffee to become a patron and a Twitch now that you can subscribe to. Get your name in the credits, join the Discord, all that stuff. Links are below. Happy Halloween. I'll see you next time.